On today's show, the guys talk with co-founder and CEO of Digital Ed, Jim Cooper. We discuss Digital Ed and the ability to meet the needs of online STEM education and research, the state of education, and the future of online learning, and so much more. Hey, there's also an EduTech tip of the week. All of that up next on EduTech Guys. You're listening to the EduTech Guys. EduTechGuys.com. Bam! Yeah, welcome to the show. I'm David Henderson. Hey, I'm Jeff Madlock. Yeah, thank you so much for tuning in, turning on, downloading, uploading, sideloading. I'm turned on. Hey, anyway, <laughs> here we go. It's going to be a great show today. Uh, real excited to have our guest on. Going to talk a little bit about post-secondary education and some stuff they do there. And, you know, the state of education, you, you learn a lot when you're in post-secondary if you're paying attention. So well, <laughs> true that. True that. Hey, listen, you can catch us on the web at www.edutechguys.com. E D U T C H G U I S. I'm trying to get that faster and faster. I've been working in the mirror this morning. So. <laughs> it's it's going to get to the point where nobody has any idea yeah. what you're saying. We'll get to <laughs> 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 Hey, listen, you can go out to Google, type in Edutech Guys. You'll find us out there. We're everywhere. Any social media, just put slash Edutech Guys, and you will find us. Or the, you know, the at sign, Empress and, no, outside, sorry. Where did I get ampersand at? That's crazy. Losing my mind. You are. Don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Hey, listen, I tell you what, <laughs> it's going to be a great show. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. And once we come back, we'll be in there with Jim Cooper. We'll be back in just a second. Welcome back. We're really excited to have our next guest on the show. Um, we're going to let him tell us who he is and what he does and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, here we go. Yeah. Oh, hi. I'm Jim Cooper. I'm the CEO of Digital Ed. Um, uh, previous to that, I was the CEO of a company called MapleSoft that did a, a symbolic math program that was is incredibly popular with higher education around the world. Yeah. And we sort of found some unique capabilities that it could bring to uh, online digital learning. So we spun off this new company called Digital Ed, and really the rest is history at this point. So let's talk about that. Let's tell us about Digital Ed and its role in uh, post-secondary, as we like to call it, you know, in, into yeah. that market. And, um, you know, using it, it's not just about the online learning. It's about the data you're pulling from it and learning how learners learn. Isn't that correct? Uh, yeah, and, and we have a sort of a luxury, you know, we're not trying to fix all of education. Um, we're very focused on a relatively narrow niche, but yeah, post-secondary, higher ed education. And we um, kind of believe that you learn at least for STEM disciplines by doing. And now, you know, this may not be applicable to all types of learning, but um, definitely my, like my background is engineering, uh, uh, a whole bunch of people at the company are, you know, in chemistry or mathematics. And it, you tend to learn a topic, not by reviewing it or attending the lecture. You actually learn by doing the assignments, doing the questions, you know, getting a concept and applying it. So we sort of believe pretty extremely, at least for STEM disciplines, that you do the majority of your learning by, by doing. Um, and we have some uh, symbolic math technology that is, I th we think, unique, that allows uh, questions to be automatically randomized and presented to students in any you know, volume that they are, are comfortable in consuming. And not only like mark the response, but give incredibly immediate, uh, uh, sophisticated feedback. Mm -hmm. So if they do get something wrong, it's they, they get um, uh, step by step examples of how how where they went wrong, how, you know, how it can be improved. And we find that this simple thing of being able to ask lots of questions on the topic and have a student apply their knowledge to answer the question is key to the learning process. I mean, there's a lot of data, which I'm sure you're aware of, 
you know, the more you can recall information to answer a question, you for, you interrupt this forgetting curve. Every time we learn something, mm -hmm. we're constantly forgetting it. And by answering questions, you uh, you interrupt that forgetting curve and you really bake in that knowledge. Um, and, and once you can do that, especially when you can do it in an automated way, so a student can come in at two in the morning and try a couple of questions on the topic and get immediate feedback, it allows you to do a lot of things. Um, I mean, it, it allows you to measure education. And one of my you know, pet peeves is that education is sometimes very, very good and sometimes not so good. But as opposed to a lot of um, professions, there hasn't been, in my opinion, in the past, strong measurement or analytics or in really no separation between the good and the bad. Like a, a great teacher does not get paid more, unfortunately, than a mediocre teacher. So I, I think one of the side benefits, I mean, this ability of learning by doing, we think is key to the learning process and gets a much better, you know, student outcome, you know, learning experience. But it has a wonderful side benefit that you can actually measure you know, uh, the progress of education. You can actually measure what lands. And, and we've had, you know, we can talk a little bit more, you know, wonderful examples of professors who have taught a subject in the same way for years and thinking that, you know, 90% of the class is catching what they're, they're pitching. And, and they actually then, you know, use some of these immediate digital questions to query the class and you know who's getting it and you know it's more or less random response like nobody knows what's going on and it's been quite shocking to them so we we think that you know one of the real side benefits are all the analytics that you can gauge the comprehension level of students in real time mm. all right so there's a lot to dig through here <laughs> so i want to i, I, I want to kind of well, I'm just going to jump in with this. Um, talking specifically, as you said, you know, you've got your your narrow niche here. You're 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 not just online learning. You're doing you know STEM online learning, and it's hands-on interactive online learning in the STEM arena. So, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to hear about some of the challenges that you you know that you have faced or that you have seen in providing STEM specific content for that hands-on experience, you know, as you said yourself, you know, you're an engineer. A lot of times I got to have the stuff in my hands to be able to manipulate that. So what does that look like in the online environment? So the challenges you ran into and then the solutions you came up with in order to address some of those. Yeah. And I, I probably would maybe take exception to online because it sounds, you know, that you're completely online. Right, it's not right. a, a hybrid uh, because I mean, I believe, I think we all believe at digital ed that, you know, we're social animals mm -hmm. and, and education really works best when you, you have an instructor that cares about your progress. And, and there's definitely group dynamics that are incredibly important to the, to the learning experience. Um, but it, like we, again, and, and I would even separate it further that I'm not absolutely sure this works in the K to nine range. You know, I, I think learning could be very, very different. So we are focused at I mean, what we call higher ed, which is sort of the nine to, you know, graduate degrees. Mm -hmm. These are, you know, people that are trying to learn. And we think that this ability of doing um, lots and lots of, we'll say, drill and practice, homework, adaptive testing, I mean, even the concept that, okay, one of the, uh, when we began testing, and we're, we're now at, you know, 500 schools around the world, and we have lots and lots of data of how students move through materials. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a concept where we felt, or I mean, I, I think a perception that there were fast students and there were slow students, and, you know, a couple in between those two. And it, it when you actually look at data, it, it really turns out that Many students are fast in some areas, but slow in other areas. Sure. And it's quite a mixed bag, much more random than we had previously thought. And what this ability of having automated testing, we actually understand the response of the student, is you can have quite an adaptive path. So every student, the areas that they understand and they get, you can move through quickly, 
the, the areas that you, you know, they're having trouble with, you can find a different way of presenting the material. So the material, like, it, and, I, and, and it's also very, we think very important uh, for both the immediacy and what I would call the atomic learning. Um, and maybe the opposite to that would be you learn something in January, you get a test on it in February, and you get feedback on it in March. Mm. Now, this is probably what I would consider in, in our point of view, bad learning. Mm. Um, because you're, there's lots of materials, you get tested across the board. By the time you get feedback, you hardly remember what you've done previously. Right. The, the model that we're finding that most of uh, uh, our, our instructors are using are much more that they present a topic and they query, you know, have questions on that topic immediately and the students get immediate feedback on how they've done. And quite often, you know, that material is only a, a 60 second uh, video that they're watching to get the material or a couple of paragraphs. So I think this atomic learning structure where you present material you then give students questions where they can apply that knowledge to answer a question uh, and give them immediate feedback on how they've done it really cements that, that learning curve. Um, so, so, so I'm not exactly sure I answered your, your question, but, but that's sort of the differences we're seeing that you can, you can use digital technology where it wasn't really possible to do that. And there's, yeah, like I said, you can randomize the questions, so the questions are all different for each pe person working in a group, so you can sort of get the group dynamics. But we, we feel that uh, learning can be much more, we'll say, bite-sized, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense, yeah. and with this immediate reinforcement of understanding the concept. And if you don't, you can adapt. I mean, if the student does not understand, you can be adaptive to potentially what they need to understand. And I think that's a, a that that is a, one of the the greatest advancements in uh, that autonomous education is the uh, where we have seen various you know programs applications you know, fill in the blank uh, that take what the student is doing and. And, and I'm, I'm going to break this down very, very simply. I know it's way more complicated than what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. But um, but essentially, you know, it, it looks at what the student is doing compared to where the student ideally would be, quote, should be, uh, and then is able to, as you have said, adapt that the, the learning and the assessment in order to help that student grow toward that ultimate goal. And I, that's, as you had mentioned, you know, that's not something that has really been around all that long. And we've not, we've not been able to do that for very long. Well, and that's it. We haven't been able to do it. I mean, like, I, you know, when I was teaching, it was, you would have a TA that would mark a test and they were really doing well if they got it back to you in, in two weeks. Right. Uh, <laughs> the, like this immediate testing, yeah, I think is, is key. And, and of course, it, it has a lot of side benefits. I mean, if you're testing the student's comprehension, you know, in kind of real time or click by click in real time, it, it, it allows you to determine, okay, is teaching the, you know, this concept this way better than that way? You can do an A-B test and get immediate feedback. I mean, my background is as a control engineer, so maybe, maybe I have a, a a wrong view on this, but yeah, I, I've always found that you don't get you know what you expect; you get what you measure. And I'm hoping that you know this type of technology, hmm. you know, blended into education generally, can actually measure the progress of education. It can actually compare. Is it better to teach this way versus that way? You know, is this better for, for student A or student B? So I, I do feel that at the root, by measuring education, you can actually improve it. You can and you can and you can and you can prove that you're improving it to a whole bunch of levels. You know, the administration, the professor level, even the student level. Uh, so I, I do think this measurement uh, is probably the almost the sleeper 
technology. Like we're, we're kind of doing this to make the educational outcomes better. And I think that's why most people are, 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 are using digital testing because it's, yes, you're right. It's easier to do. They can do more testing. Mm -hmm. Students can control, you know, how many um, uh, questions they, they want to tackle. But I do think underneath it, if we could develop this so it, it measures the effectiveness of education, like that's like that's uh, like the printing press, you know, that could change the future of education. Well, you know, I think what I love what we're talking about here, because now that you especially when you said you only get what you measure and I completely 100 percent agree with that statement, because that's that's exactly the truth. And that's always been our problem in education is we can't get the results back quick enough, not just for the learner, but for the teacher. Because that makes a huge difference for a teacher because we all know that our results are what create us to make that instant review. And if I have to wait too long to review, then I'm breaking that chain of my beautiful, yes. you know, my beautiful red line of, of, of nylon string structure that I'm trying to build to that one point. Um, and so to me, especially in secondary, especially with this digital ability to have it instantaneously, that gives us the the administration that gives the people providing professional development the ability to build better uh, professional development to help a teacher learn on the fly review when they get that back just like you said here's this one question let me see what they're getting they're not getting anything okay how do I monitor and adjust yeah. really quickly yeah this is a beautiful beautiful idea so let me ask this what's the next step is you know what's the AI What's going to happen with it? How is it going to evolve to the next step? And what kind of data are you using to pull that, you know, pull in? I know because I know you guys are looking at the next step. You're, you're an engineer. You're always looking for a better way to to make it structurally yeah. sound. So, <laughs> well, well, I would say the big thing is we're honestly almost drowning in data. Like, mm -hmm. because, I mean, even if you, you know, uh, combine face to face, but like you take the lecture and maybe do something else and you use that face to face time in a given way. Um, and you're constantly, you know, asking questions and you can see the students progress and comprehension. Not only can you be absolutely clear to both the teacher and the student, you know, where they are in that learning curve, uh, but you, uh, like you can get click by click data almost like every concept you, you've got how much time they've spent on it whether they get it right or wrong mm. how many attempts they've they've tried so we're drowning in a sea of data um and i think the next step is exactly as you said using machine learning and ai to take that incredibly rich data source and and to make education uh, adaptable way beyond where it is today like today you get it right, you you get harder stuff. If you get it wrong, you get easier stuff. But I think we can go way beyond that. Like there, I, I think we all know there are different people learn in different ways. With this data source and using machine learning and AI techniques, I think you'll be able to actually present the same concept, but to a different type of learner. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, uh, that's uh, like that is definitely I, I would say on the horizon. Like. It's amazing what you can do with a sea of data. Mm -hmm. And we have a sea of data. And you know, we're we're even looking, we've got many courses that are sort of taught with the same material, but some of them are taught in North America and some of them are taught in Europe, some of them are taught in Singapore. And we can compare the classes progress in these very different, we'll say social cultures. And and it's it's really interesting data, but it's not absolutely clear what you do with it. You know, and I think that's where, you know, AI techniques, machine learning techniques, it will, uh, it will determine, you know, well, how can you most effectively use the, this ocean of data that we're collecting, you know, beyond just the high level analytics. So, Jim, the state of education, as you see it right now, and what you were just talking about, a special learner, a different kind of learner. Do you think that's what we're doing now is we're in a time where it's going to take us some time to build new learners. I know that that's, you know, kind of a hard way to say it, but it, where do you see the state of education in the world, you know, in the U S in Canada, in the world, in, in Europe, where do you see us at right now? What do you think is our, our biggest um, achievements over the last two years and what's our biggest pitfalls coming forward? 
Well, you know, I, I don't, I think education gets a bad rap. rap. I mean, again, I, I'm more focused on higher ed and like, and I do think K to nine is a different, um, a, a different subject. It is, uh, but I, <laughs> it's a different beast. It's, but it's hurting I, cats I think, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> So I think post-secondary, you know, generally does a relatively good job. And I think we're, we're now providing tools that will make it do a much better, better job and sort of as a side benefit of of going through covid the number of professors instructors that i've spoken to who have said effectively you know i never would have tried this before covid Mm. but now that i have i will never go back to the old way i will use the tools so i think covid would had a you know silver lining in that it it allowed people it forced people to use the tools and now they appreciate the value. So it's probably a faster change than we would have gotten with it without COVID. Um, so um, it's almost um, limitless what what we can do. Um, but yeah, yeah, the, the, uh, it is very much about um, uh, I think we have the tools to, to structure for different learnings, mm-hmm. learners, uh, but we do also have to understand that, okay, writing a textbook is a hard thing to do. Writing a textbook at, we'll say, 10 different levels that you would need to be truly adaptive mm-hmm. <laughs> is at least 10 times harder, you know, maybe, maybe more. So it will come down to, I would say, great content. I mean, I, I think great instructors as well. Like it'd be this combination of of great content and great instructors, and then tools that can adopt ad, adapt that content to particular student learning types. Um, and and like the that's where I sort of come back to the measurement because where before I think there was a great deal of debate. I mean, what was, who was the best instructor? Who, who, you know, what was the best content for, for learning, you know, limits and calculus? Like, and and maybe there's a couple of best for different instructors, but I I don't think we could really determine it without the measurement component. And that's why I think being able to measure uh, like which one is actually functioning better, uh, is key to like, so there's a huge amount of work in developing, I would say, state of the art digital content. It's much harder than writing a textbook. Like (laughs) writing a textbook is kind of one dimensional (laughs) page at a time, Mm -hmm. few diagrams that you add in Uh, digital content. Not only do you, are you adding randomized questions and, and the questions especially in this, you know, where we are operating in education now, it can't be a question that a student can just Google and get the answer. Exactly. It, like there are particular questions you, know, you can ask a question in a way that you can't really Google and just get the answer. Uh, and I think that's the way you have to design uh, the, the, these questions. So every question effectively becomes an open book. Mm-hmm. question open book to the entire world of knowledge <laughs> and and that is very doable um and, and then each one of those questions will be randomized you know so that you know you get a new version every time um it probably will be adaptive so you come come through um concepts you know there, there is going to be text images animations you know videos interspersed so um where i would say writing a great textbook you had a, a you know a paint palette of four different colors, and now you suddenly have thirty colors, and I think it will take some time for us to really realize the potential of what um, we'll say digitally based content can do. Yeah, absolutely. So, have you had any? So, for our listeners out there, because there's a lot of a, a lot of educators that are going to hear this. What have been their biggest pitfalls in making sure that this went this this went through with fidelity, and not your pitfalls, not digital eds, but the pitfalls from the schools, uh, the pitfalls from the classrooms? Is it? Uh, and this is something we talk about a lot, especially K through twelve and in post secondary. Um, you know, bandwidth, uh, the right devices, things like that. Could could you speak to that a little bit? Well, you know, probably the one is what we were just talking about. It's the development of the content. I mean, I, I, again, COVID. Pr- pushed a lot of people online probably sooner than they were ready mm-hmm. for it. And 
you can do very bad digital content, you know, like PDF, no interactivity, you can really lose engagement quickly. Where And, and good digital content is the opposite. You know, you have animations, you have uh, um, great short videos, like not like we, we all, I think we all know that long videos do not work in online education. Um, uh, you can have, you know, engagement through insightful questions where you know, students actually feel interested. One of our instructors, uh, they, it was interesting, um, during COVID, they weren't going to class and she did escape rooms mm. where the rooms you went into the empty classrooms that they hadn't been to. <laughs> so they had to answer the right question. So like, I think you can de like develop all these questions, but the biggest pitfall is it takes time and probably more time uh, to write really effective digital content and use the full capabilities of what the you know pl the online platforms can do yeah. uh, and some schools we work with they have you know they're they're they have the resources to at least attempt doing that like so many schools they have you know a hundred people developing digital courses just for their own right. students right. Um, eighty percent of schools don't have those resources, you know? So they, you've got an instructor that is teaching and, do, and doing a whole bunch of other things. And he's trying to, to develop digital material as well. And it's even tougher, unfortunately, because we're uh, a textbook, you might update every five years, maybe three years and a really something popular. So you have at least some time period. Digital content, if you get something wrong, you get feedback from the students the next day and you have to fix it the next day. So it has a much faster iteration cycle. Yeah. Um, so I think that's all good. Like the measurement, the iteration to make it better, faster, being able to, like, I think that's all good. But I would say the biggest uh, pitfall we've had is it, not everyone simply has the time mm. to stop and develop, we'll say, to use the tools to develop content to their full potential in the cloud-based digital environment. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've been having an amazing conversation. Uh, and if folks want to reach out to you guys and get in touch with you to continue the conversation, to pick your brain, to to see what else uh, may be out there to further, uh, you know, talking about uh, digital ed itself or some of the, the you know, kind of navigating that sea of data, uh, as you say, what are some ways that they can reach out to you and get a hold of you guys? But, you know, it, it's all through our website, you know, uh, www.digitaled.com. Uh, and there's lots of, you know, white papers, peer reviewed papers on learning techniques. Um, there's no lack of, of schools that are definitely trying to take this to the next level. Um, and, and yeah, contact to myself and everyone else, you know, within the company is there. And, you know, the best um, quite often is, we very actively try to connect instructors who are just moving into this with schools that we consider to be have done like no one's done but you know they've come a long way so and we do find that that educator to educator contact mm -hmm. is very valuable like to even having discussions uh, on things they've tried that haven't worked things that they've tried have worked in their experiences so we really have a quite a an active community, you know, via the website. And we do try to make these connections uh, between educators who are interested and educators who are, have tried many things within this, uh, especially within the last two years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been very enlightening. And I think the word for the day is measure measurement. I think that's the word we're going to talk, we're going to use now with in key conversations as we move forward in our entities, our educational entities as we do. So thank you again I, I, for coming on. I fully agree. You know, it's been, been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks much. Hey, thank you so much to Jim Cooper from Digital Ed for spending a little time with us this afternoon. Yeah, really, really great stuff. Yeah, very cool. Hey, you know what time it is. It's time for the Agitech Tip of the Week. Yeah. 
<laughs> hey, the Edge Tech Tip of the Week this week comes from Monica Burns, good friend of ours, if you don't know her stuff. Class Tech Tips, classtechtips.com. It's wonderful stuff. She has a great article out today. You can check it out on our Twitter. We'll retweet it for you or check it out on hers, Class Tip, Clack class tech tips it is how to quickly access movies to share with students because you know it's hard to get some movies in the classroom nowadays i mean you can't use netflix can't use it unless your school pays for it you got dvd equipment who's got a dvd equipment anymore seriously you know you got a vcr on a car yeah. <laughs> you guys want the vcr down there hey listen who's turning the who's turning the film strip today so you know there's all kinds of stuff when it comes to legality and your school probably you know is it, it we're all trying to make sure we do the right thing and we don't break the rules but there's a new streaming platform out there for K-12 schools called Swank uh, K-12 Streaming, swank.com. Over 30,000 movies and documentaries. So, you know, she suggests you go out, you take a look at it, see what they can do for your school, see if there's stuff out there you could use. I'm sure with 30,000 titles and it's for K-12, that's pretty awesome. You know, that's that's another great resource that's out there. I'm sure that they've got different kind of plans depending on how much you want to use and how big your school is. So yeah. That sounds kind of some cool that's stuff. That's very cool. You know, that's a big one now. You know, we, we even, we actually, uh, it, in my district, we use the Arkansas digital sandbox yeah. to filter our YouTube. So, you know, you can't go to actual YouTube. You have to do it through there because, you know, it's just safer, safer for our kids and yeah. and keeps all that kind of clean and dandy. But hey, listen, check it out, swank.com. Uh, check out Class Tech Tips from Monica Burns, uh, classtechtips.com. And that's pretty cool stuff. So that's the tech tip of the week. Yeah, right there. Hey, listen, uh, it's been a great show. It has. Very, very uh, informative, very entertaining. Very informative. That's true. Hey, listen, I'm Jeff Madlock. I'm David Henderson. We'll catch you next time. You've been listening to the EduTech Guys. EduTechGuys.com.